Claire, thank you so much for joining me. I've been really excited about this conversation because it's something that I have definitely tuned into a lot over the last year or two. Uh, I read your book. I found it, if I'm honest, terrifying, depressing, and then uh, uplifting in turn. But it does certainly seem like you can't open a paper now or, or a social media page without seeing words like freedom of speech, assault on freedom of speech, no platforming, um, you know, ab abusive content, you know, don't agree, do agree, you know, misogynist, you know, words that effectively are shutting down debate. I would love to hear from you as to your sort of general perspective from the book, I find that offensive, as to what's going on here? How would you sort of describe this movement and what's happening in society today? Well, I noticed about five years ago, I do a lot of speeches at universities and at schools, in my role at the Academy of Ideas, that rather than people arguing back against me, that more and more young people particularly were saying, I find that offensive. And they didn't mean to be sharing that with me, they meant shut up. I mean, it was a chilling impact. You know, I find that offensive was don't carry on, it's gonna be too hurtful. And I looked into the eyes of many of the young people who said this, and I realized that they didn't want to debate or discuss with me. They wanted to, to close down debate by saying they personally had their feelings hurt by something they found offensive. And I was uh, worried that this would mean that they would get stuck in the rut of only hearing one side of an opinion, and that also it indicated, and the theme of today, a certain lack of resilience, because if you're not able to hear lots of different opinions and argue back, then actually you can um, posit yourself as quite a fragile person. So, you know, there's daft and silly and egregious examples from university campuses that we're maybe all familiar with, the fact that a Mexican-themed uh, 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 tequila party was closed down as racist um, at, at, at one university, a situation where NUS Women's Conference banned clapping and only allowed jazz hands because they said that clapping was going to trigger post-traumatic stress disorder in people. You could people. all please pay attention so to I, that. You know, I'm no quite, clapping, I'm only quite jazz fragile. hands. Um, and I started to, you know, and there's, and there's, you know, walking past a statue of Cecil Rhodes at Oxford University, undoubtedly Cecil Rhodes, a contentious figure, uh, a, a pro-colonialist uh, with views uh, at the time that we would consider racist today. And so you might say that about the Cecil Rhodes statue. But when students started organizing to take the statue down and saying that walking past it was an act of violence and was on a par with being uh, enslaved, I thought, you know, if young people feel that walking past the statue is akin to slavery, they're not going to stand a chance in the real world. And so I started to investigate what has become known, in a rather derogatory sense, as Generation Snowflake. Um, Generation Snowflake is an insult. If you look at Wikipedia, it says that I am responsible for introducing the phrase. But it's Wikipedia, so you don't have to believe that. But I wrote a book that was addressed to and about a generational shift of young people being too thin-skinned and easily offended, and why I thought that that was not going to do them any good. Because, yeah, what was interesting about what, you, what I read was that it's, it's not just the shutting down of debate by saying offence. You actually, you witness in these people that they are offended, that words are actually uh, hitting them to the core, and that you'd have people at these debates practically in tears because they felt their religion was being undermined or, or, or annihilated in some way. You know, this wasn't faux offence. It's genuine offence that appears to be happening. But I think that there's a danger that we miss the point if we think that this is posturing students or that even that they'll grow out of it. Because what I realized and what I was interested in was how deeply felt, sincere, and internalized this sense of young people feeling that they couldn't cope with hearing words or ideas that discomforted them. That was a genuine thing. And so one of the phenomenal cultural shifts of recent years is that university students now demand safe spaces, demand a place where they can be safe, not physically, but from ideas which they find discomforting. Now, I, I don't know about you, but when I was 18, and when I went to university at the time, or whether you went to work, you know, the last thing I wanted to do was to feel safe. 
I mean, I wanted to take risks, be experimental, push back boundaries, not kind of cower in a safe space and, and kind of say, oh, no, go away. I mean, this struck me as a, a, a big shift that was not uh, allowing young people to really fly and, 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 and you know, enjoy being young. Mm. But it's, it seems, I mean, universities is, a, is an important part of this because it's obviously where people are learning to hone their ideologies and, and, and their, their, their political thinking uh, at that sort of age and also how to engage in debate. But it's happening everywhere. I mean, I, I, I've certainly experienced it for myself along feminist lines, for example, where you've got Me Too and it's very difficult to talk about any of the greyer questions in the middle of what becomes a very black and white debate without an immediate th uh, missile being thrown of misogynist rape apologist, which as soon as that missile's thrown, you know, that person's opinion is no longer valid and is excluded from the, the conversation. And it, it strikes me this is something that social media actually exacerbates in some way because of the short-form nature of, of the debate. Um, you know, is it, it, we, are we all snowflakes now? Is, 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 that, is that what you think? It's, a, it's, a, it's an important observation because on the one hand, universities, which now, of course, almost 50% of the cohort go to universities, so there's an awful lot of young people there, are based on the notion of academic freedom and the possibilities of exploring intellectually new ideas. And part of your intellectual development, your academic development, of course, must be that you are discomforted. You know, your ideas are shaken up. Everything you've previously known is challenged and academic research which has given us everything from you know cures in terms of medicine through to uh, uh, great insights into the ancient world all of those things require no boundaries to what is explored but it's not just academic this is a broader culture of you can't say that and your point about the labeling of people indicates just how narrowly prescriptive the set of views are that one is allowed to pursue these days i mean you know, it's not just a question of saying, oh, well, this is a very enlightened uh, situation where we call people racist when they're racist, because you can be called a racist, um, as one young woman in America has been, has hit social media recently, because she wore a Chinese dress to a prom, and she's not Chinese, and she was called uh, somebody who culturally appropriated Asian culture, a racist, and she because it was social media, was piled on, as they say, by hundreds of thousands of people, a 19-year-old girl. And that, it seems to me, is one of the problems, as you say, you can be uh, uh, accused of rape denial if you're worried about, or, you know, a rapist apologist, or if you say, as I do, that it's very important to defend the principle of uh, innocence until proven guilty when it comes to sexual assault cases, people will say, you're victim shaming, how dare you? You're suffering internalized misogyny. So these labels are used very quickly to shut down debate and discussion. Mm -hmm. So I don't know in that sense that that's an indication of we're all snowflakes, but it does indicate that society has become incredibly intolerant of views that don't fit into a very, very narrow spectrum spectrum of what appear to be progressive. I mean, I'm an anti-racist. I was involved in women's liberation movement. I'm a, you know, I'm a well-known kind of on the left uh, sort of person. And yet when I hear somebody say, you oh, know, as an anti-racist and as a woman, I find that offensive. You just feel that the progressive arguments for equality of the past have almost become weaponized as a way of ensuring that only one version of the truth is heard. That scares the life out of me. Mm -hmm. and go, it's just going back to this sort of what's happening at universities. From, from reading the book, you actually identify that it's starting at a much younger age, which is something that I'm very interested in as a mother of, of three young children. How do you think the way in which we're bringing ch up children these days might be, might be playing a role in this? Well, I was fascinated that First of all, I was noticing this in schools, but secondly, that I thought that, you know, at 18, you suddenly didn't arrive at 18 and suddenly start saying, I want to no platform this feminist or no platform or not hear that argument or I want safety. So um, as I was somebody who taught for many years, I started to think about some of the policies that might have started to chip away at young people's resilience preloading them with anxieties before they ever got to mm -hmm. university, making them scared of words. And I realized that a lot of educational policies and a lot of parenting, um, uh, popular parenting uh, devices did two things. Either we kind of 
obsessively tell young people that safety, uh, that their safety is the most important thing. We won't let them go and play outside. Uh, there's a kind of culture of overprotection and cotton wool kids. Uh, these days, uh, young people are constantly told to be fearful of paedophiles around every corner, of any number of different things. Even eating chocolate and drinking sugary drinks is like a death threat hanging over them. And so we kind of scaremonger young people to imagine that around every corner something terrible is awaiting them. And at the same time, we also tell them that they're the most important people in the world. You know, we're constantly part of uh, social and educational theory says that, you know, if we tell young people that maybe they're not as good as they think they are at something, that we're going to damage their self-esteem forever. And um, we tell young people through um, policies on bullying and anti-bullying, which of course, you know, who wants to support bullying? Um, but here we go. Um, I, I think that <laughs> if you look at the way the concept of bullying has been so broadened out, it now can be name-calling, it can be uh, hostile gestures, and my favorite one is uh, exclusion from friendship group. So if you're 10 and your friends don't invite you to the pictures with them on a Friday night, that is officially bullying in educational land. And young people are told this, and then they're told that if you're bullied when you're 10, it's going to damage you forever. It's going to have long-lasting psychological damage on everything. So we wonder why at 18, students go to university and somebody says something horrible to them and they go, oh my God, I'm going to be damaged forever, right? We taught them that, right? So ironically, Generation Snowflake, with a sense of entitlement where they say, my feelings are what count. You know, you can't say that because you're hurting me. Um, we socialize them that way. And in that sense, I think we've got to take some responsibility. Yeah, there's a, there's a narcissism to it, actually, isn't there? And, and I, I've been thinking this with my own children. You've got to be nice to everyone the whole time. People aren't going to be nice to you the whole time when you enter the real world. You know, some people will like you, some people won't. And you just won't be prepared for that, let alone the competitive, cutthroat nature of many industries, business, politics, media. That, that many of these children will want to get into. It's just, um, uh, you know, they, they won't be prepared for that because they've got to play nicely. It's the taking part that matters, not the winning. Uh, no, exactly. And guess what? It's the winning. Um, I, I think <laughs> that... Um, I think that the, the other thing is, is that actually it's insulting to young people because, you know, one of the things that you have to realise is if, you know, I, I give many speeches, at po go to policy events, and there's almost been a kind of de rigueur, 16-year-old that's kind of trotted out to speak on the stage, and they get a standing ovation before they've said a word. And it's the adults in the room are kind of going, oh, 16, how marvellous, do you know what I mean? And then that kind of uh, actually shows a real indifference and contempt to that young person. You know, if we tell young people that they're interesting the whole time, actually it just means we're not listening to them. Because sometimes, sometimes they're interesting, sometimes they're not, right? And, and, and uh, they deserve to be taken more seriously. It's condescending to say that because they're young, that they are, by the very nature of it, insightful. And obviously, by the very nature of being young, you're not that insightful. So, <laughs> partly, we as adults have a responsibility to encourage young people to recognize that in order to be um, taken seriously, they have to have something to say that's interesting, and therefore, we've got to tell them when they're saying things that are dull and anodyne and, and so on. Um, but the other thing is, you know, whether they can cope, this is important, isn't it? Because, you know, the National Union of Students did a survey of students um, last year, I think it was, where 78% of uh, students self-reported that they'd have mental health problems the year before, 78%. Now, I worked in mental health social work for many years when I graduated, and I understand the absolute horrors of mental illness. But for people to pathologize and understand hurt feelings and the vicissitudes of life and mm. exam stress and so on as a mental health problem, it does indicate to me that they actually aren't coping and that, in fact, we really have got a problem that young people have internalized this sense of vulnerability and fragility to such an extent that they really do perceive themselves as ill and, and um, you know, needing protection, needing intervention to look after them, infantilizing them, in fact. Um, 
So again, as I say, we have a responsibility to say to young people, you know, this is not doing you any good. This is why I was depressed. <laughs> um, it's that part of the book, it does get better. Um, so, I mean, coming on to, I guess, the more contentious nature of freedom of speech, which is what ultimately what you're advocating. Uh, I mean, the argument, which I think can be a strong one, is that it's ultimately speech which incites greater acts of, of, of violence, of oppression, of, of discrimination. How, where is the spectrum there? And, and how do we think about speech when it comes to incitement? Where does freedom of speech end? Um, and you know, how do we teach people about those barriers? So I, um, I, first of all, I'm a free speech absolutist, no ifs, no buts. I think that um, we have to be very careful about suggesting that incitement is a straightforward matter because it takes responsibility for actions from the person who acts to something that they've um, heard. So you can just say um, that, oh, well, I went and heard a speaker, and as a consequence, I kind of launched a racist pogrom, right? I mean, you know, um, no, you decided, having heard the speaker, you know, most of the audience heard the racist speaker and decided to become an anti-racist as a consequence. I mean, it's not as though we all straightforward. We're not like attack dogs, you know? I, I can tell you what I think here today, and you're all thinking different things. I mean, I can't just kind of keep saying, listen to me and do what I say. I mean, if only it was so easy, then education would be a doddle, wouldn't it? Um, you, 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 that is not the way it works. Um, but I'm also nervous about things that we assume are incitement, because if you look at legislation now that's increasingly coming in, but certainly more informally, the notion of hate crime or hate speech, if you actually explore what that is, first of all, even the police say that you can call something a hate crime with no evidence, just based on the subjective report of it. You'll then find that what people constitute hate crime might be wearing that Chinese dress, or to, well, you know, the famous Charlie Hebdo cartoons, right? Are we saying that the Charlie Hebdo cartoonists uh, incited uh, barbaric acts in Paris because they said something which somebody considered hateful. I think not. And you might even think that they were racist. And then the final thing I'd say is, the idea that speech is harm. You know, J.S. Mill, one of my great heroes, the great uh, 19th century free speech philosopher, said that you know, we should have free speech in all instances unless there's a harm principle, unless it harms someone. He meant a very narrow sense of that. Now we have a broadened sense of harm, which is psychological harm. And that ends up basically being interpreted as saying words that hurt me or harm me because they upset me. And that's where we end up with safe spaces and no platforming at universities. So I think you can hear words that, you, that hurt you in the sense that you're upset. I hear things that offend me all the time. People say horrible things to me. Or if somebody says something that's sexist and misogynist and vile and personal, of course, I don't mean, you know, I kind of go, oh, yeah, brush it off, right? But I have no entitlement to close it down. And I need free speech to be able to argue back or to be able to have a campaign to kind of, you know, deal with that person, all those ideas. Yeah, it, it's the shutting down of debate, I suppose, that, that, that is perhaps the most damaging byproduct of a lot of this. Do you think that it's contributing to some of today's uh, political trends that we're observing? I think that we've seen this phenomenon of, first of all, labeling people uh, in a kind of ad hominem way, but also by using these, you know, transphobic, Islamophobic, and so on, um, as a way of closing down debate. I think that, sadly, we are in a situation where we are confining ourselves to echo chambers. And you can see that although we might laugh at or think it's hilarious to see young people hiding away in their safe spaces, um, you know, uh, at universities with their um, bubble wrap, by the way, is very popular, and uh, therapy dogs um, to kind of deal with the stresses of life. You know, we think that's all kind of, oh, can you imagine how immature? And yet, actually, you'll see people saying, I'm blocking so-and-so on Twitter, or I'm getting rid of all of my Facebook friends who voted Brexit. I'm not having anything to do. I don't want to hear. You know, I think it's why we were so blindsided by um, Brexit and, and uh, uh, um, Donald Trump's election, in fact, because 
people were kind of so busy talking to people who agreed with them and having their own views narcissistically uh, focused back on them, they didn't notice that you know millions and millions of people didn't agree with them. The other thing that we're seeing more and more of as a political trend is identity politics, and I find that the most divisive and dangerous aspect, that people see themselves not as defined, you know, it's no longer what you say that matters, but who is saying it. So you will have people say, you know, as a, uh, uh, you know, you as a white person cannot comment on that because that is the preserve of black people talking about it. It's kind of racializing in that way. As somebody who's been involved in women's politics for many years, I don't see women's liberation as something that women do. I think it's a matter of equality that we should all be involved in. So demonizing men and saying, you've got no right to speak on that, or saying that if you haven't suffered uh, 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 sexual abuse, you're not allowed to talk about it. I mean, it kills off our capacity our great enlightenment breakthrough, where we saw ourselves as rational, objective people who could understand the world beyond simply having experienced it. But instead, what we do is confine ourselves in ghettos and boxes where we say, no, I'm entitled to speak on that, you're not. And mm -hmm. so those broad political trends, by the way, we see them in politics all the time. Mm -hmm. It's something that I'm watching and getting increasingly concerned about with women in business and technology, because these are apparently such hard industries to be a woman in, uh, which I don't believe is the case. I actually think it's, it's a fantastic opportunity. I am noticing women assuming that when they're not progressing or getting knocked back, that it's because of a gender reason. And possibly it could be, actually, on many of those occasions. But it's still not the best way to approach that because it stops you self-internalizing, analyzing yourself and coming up with constructive ways in which you can circumvent the status quo and actually resilience, building resilience to, to climb your, your barriers. So it is something that I, the victimhood mentality around identity, it's the least interesting thing about us. You know, we all have so much more in common with those with the same values and outlook than we do with anyone because we share chromosomes skin colour, you know, whatever else it may be. Um, so it, it's certainly something... Uh, I just very quickly on, on, on the victim point, I think that somebody has called identity politics, or rather described it rather well, as the oppression Olympics. And there's a, there's a, um, a, a theory called intersectionality, which is to kind of... Uh, effectively, you have more right to speak um, the more you have been victimised historically over the years. So, you know, what you find is, is that, first of all, you start off saying as a woman, then you say as a black woman, or then you say as a black disabled woman, and so on, and you kind of accrue points. Of course, if you're a white um, cis man, you're out, and you've got nowhere to go. I mean, you're just so privileged. But it's, it's the thing about that is it incites people to show their scars. I mean, what you end up doing is sort mm. of, in order to gain permission to speak, you basically, you know, I, I can basically give you my list of terrible things that have happened, my working class background. You know, my family are Irish, right? The British caused the famine. Every bad thing that happened to me is because my ancestors suffered the famine. How dare you disagree with me on, I don't know, Brexit. I mean, you know what I mean? It doesn't, <laughs> I mean, it's like sort of like, you, you, you end up in a situation where you, you trot all this out. You actually, uh, interestingly, in order to accrue your victim points, what's more is you kind of plunder the suffering, the genuine suffering of one's ancestors very often. And you then accrue points. That's why you have things called microaggressions, where you basically say very small things add up. There's a uh, campaign called Everyday Sexism, and um, they, they say the most trivial things that all add up to the, the equivalent of kind of being abused as a woman. But they don't, they're trivial things. Um, but it's a way of accruing victim points. Mm. I'm conscious that we could talk all day, and uh, I don't have a clock, so if anyone can wave at me to give me a sense, um, we can't see it. But, but I'm determined that we don't leave things on such a depressing, negative note. Come on, Claire. Are you confident that any of these trends can be reversed? Um, and if so, I guess, what do you see as some of, some of the solutions or positive ways in which we can approach these challenges? Um, First of all, I absolutely think these trends can be reversed, but it's not a cycle and it won't happen spontaneously. You know, there's nothing more dispiriting um, when one imagines it to think, God, middle-aged woman writes book moaning about modern youth. 
Um, <laughs> I, I, I really thought I was kind of letting myself in for something. Uh, one of the great things about it is the people who've absolutely hated my book, uh, educational psychologists, uh, sociologists, and people my own age, who have actually uh, are responsible for Generation Snowflake. And gratifyingly, many of the most enthusiastic people who've liked my book are young. Because the point about Generation Snowflake is it's a generational trend, but it's insulting to young people, and many young people see and feel that they're in a trap and they're walking on eggshells even amongst their peers, and they don't want that. So um, what needs to happen is that those young people are um, encouraged by us and given permission to kind of fight back uh, in, in terms of fighting for free speech. I also think that grown-ups have got to behave like grown-ups and look young people in the eye and tell them when they're talking nonsense, uh, uh, have the confidence to say what you believe, not back off and apologize at the merest hint of somebody calling you uh, a horrible name. Um, uh, uh, you know, when people say, I find that offensive, I say, fine, and, and, and I'm sorry you do, but I'm going to explain what I'm talking about, not back off. Think how many people apologize straight away. I mean, you're apologizing before you've kind of finished the sentence. So I'm, I, I think that what my solutions are is that we need to both uh, launch as a society an intellectual campaign in support of open, free debate and discussion. Um, and we need to encourage young people to think critically and to get out of safe spaces and echo chambers. And I always say to young people, you know, read widely, read everything, right? Go and listen to speakers that you're going to hate. And if it confirms that you hate them more, that's good because you'll have a better argument because you'll have heard their argument, you'll know what their weaknesses are. But you might, just might, have your mind changed too. So, of course, there's hope because every generation, even though it has its challenges, has people who are brave enough to fight back. And the Academy of Ideas, um, through our Battle of Ideas Festival, through our, our debating competition for Sixth Formers Debating Matters, meets young people all the time who say, I am determined to not let this be the, uh, the main way that my generation is known. Um, and so we owe it to them as older people. If you're young, join that movement. If you're, if you're a bit older, um, um, then what we've got to do is to be brave and give a lead. I, uh, I was struck by the fact that you're noticing some of the, the anti-snowflakes, I think you refer to them, um, trying to fight fire with fire sometimes, yeah. offence with offence. Uh, and that that isn't a productive way forward, that it's, it should be one to listen, cajole, and actually bring the debate forward. Uh, and the expression I always love is, is to play the ball and not the player. I blame social media, and I'm younger than you, so um, I, I don't know whether that's going to be considered old-fashioned now as well. Yeah, I mean, I think social media does amplify these problems, as you mentioned earlier, and I think it's... Uh, there are very dangerous twitch hunts because I, I don't want to be glib about this. People are losing their jobs for misspeaking or saying something. I don't know if you saw, but the, there's, there's some um, uh, lifeboatmen who've just been sacked because they had a mug um, with um, some rather sexist pictures on it, a, a, a naked woman with one of the lifeboatmen's heads on it. It was a secret Santa gift. And then the RNLI looked at their WhatsApp messages, private messages between two people, and they were sacked, right? They were volunteers as well. When I say they were sacked, what it means is, is that they earn no money, mm. but they are no longer saving lives on the seas. These are brave, brave people, right? Mm. And what the RNLI said was, um, you know, these kind of banter and this kind of bullying atmosphere and this kind of attitude to women will not be tolerated. We will not tolerate it. And I think we need to get a sense of perspective. Um, but the fact that um, some of these things get, these twitch hunts lead to people losing their jobs, lead to people being publicly shamed. You know, the disgrace that Sir Tim Hunt, you know, the great medical scientist, was driven out of this country, effectively lost his jobs at universities, um, uh, if you remember, because he told a slightly uh, off-colour uh, joke about girls crying in the labs uh, when he was in Korea. Uh, doing a speech. By the time he got back off the plane into the UK, there was an international scandal about him and he was being denounced as a misogynist. 
By the way, Tim Hunter dedicated his life to going around schools to encourage young people to study science. He's not doing that now because he was driven out by a mob. So in that sense, social media amplifies and creates some of those problems, but it's not to blame. But we've got to believe in free speech, that's the point. We've got to rediscover what it was that a free society represented for us. You know, we say that we're worried about authoritarian regimes in Syria, in Turkey, where they're locking people up in universities for saying the wrong thing or closing down newspapers. We worry about China, you know, and, and, and we, we, we panic about the, uh, the, the terrible way that you can arbitrarily be you know, sacked in China for saying the wrong thing, criticizing the government, and then we sack people here because they give the wrong secret Santa mug away uh, to their mate, right? I, I mean, it, this, is, this is as scary and authoritarian in an insidious way, and it's up to us to it, say, we live in a free society, we're not having this. I absolutely agree. I don't think we could have ended on a, on, a, on a better note, actually. So, Claire, I thank you very, very much, and I wish you all the best with everything thank you you're doing. Thank you very much.